Welcome, everyone. My name is Francesca Bell, and I'm the events person for the Marin Poetry Center. And tonight, we are very excited to have Meryl Natchez and Brenda Hillman here. They are going to be reading from translations. And um, I'm particularly excited. I've recently started working on translations, so I'm looking forward to the question and answer period at the end. Um, and before we start, we always have a couple of announcements. And the first one is um, I want to urge all of our members to submit to our anthology. We have an anthology that we put out. It's, um, you have to be a member to submit, but it's only $25 to become a member. And it's a really wonderful, wonderful community to be a part of. And this year, our, um, our theme is Lifelines. And we have some... Um, some papers on the back if you want to see just some examples of what would be acceptable under that topic, because they're many and varied. And the deadline for that is March 15th. And then Becky Faust had an announcement she wanted to make also. And for those of us sending manuscripts around, we know what a big deal that is. <laughs> that may be harder than anything you'll ever do. Um, okay, so we're going to get moving. And uh, Meryl's going to go first for us tonight. And her most recent book, uh, you have to forgive me, I'm probably going to mangle some Russian last names. Um, so her most recent book is a bilingual volume of translations from the Russian, poems from the Stray Dog Cafe, Akhmatova, Mandelstam and Gumilev. <laughs> um, she's also co-translator of a name I'll let her say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Selected poems. And a contributor to Against Forgive Forgetting, 20th Century Poet of Wit Poetry of Witness. Her book of poems, Jade Suit, appeared in 2001. Her poems and translations have appeared in many literary magazines and anthologies including the Pinch Literary Review, Atlanta Review, and the Lyric. She also has had a career as a technical writer. And then the thing that impressed me the most since I am in the process and someday hopefully will, be, will have been successful at raising three children, she has raised four children. <laughs> so please welcome Meryl. Thanks, Francesca. Uh, Francesca took over all the logistics for this, and Donna Emerson, uh, thanks to her for suggesting it, and for the Marin Poetry Center for being here. It's really such a pleasure to read. Uh, I'm going to read a few poems from the Stray Dog Cafe book, and I'm very lucky to have a volunteer who can read a couple of them in Russian, Harsha Raum, who is an associate professor of Slavic literature and cultural studies and language. and language. And has so many credits, you couldn't even believe it. When I saw his page, I just like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to do a little reading in Russian, which will be so great for you, for those of you who can't read Cyrillic, to hear the amazing crunchiness and musicality of the Russian language. I first came to this project when I was a junior in high school. And I discovered Mandelstam in the stacks of the Widener Library. And I was just blown away by his work, which had not been translated at that time. And ever since, I've been fascinated by him and uh, the Acmeist movement in Russia. At the time that the Imagists were coming to the fore in the early 1900s in the West, there was a parallel movement in St. Petersburg throwing away the kind of old, Victorian, elaborate, hyperbolized verse and trying to create something original and spare and authentic. And that movement was led by a character who must have been something um, like Robert Duncan, a very charismatic and romantic character who drew people to him, uh, whose name was Nikolai Gumilev. And he and Akhmatova, who was a great beauty, Anna Akhmatova, actually got married briefly and had a son. 
Uh, but Gumilev proved to be a, a better lover than husband material, and their marriage didn't last too long. <laughs> Fortunately, their poetic movement has lasted, and um, I hope to give you a little taste of that tonight. Unfortunately for them, all that energy and all that wonderful creativity came at a time in history that wasn't very favorable for poets. And Gumilev himself was executed as a traitor in 1921. Mandelstam uh, was exiled and went to his death for a poem he wrote about Stalin. And Akhmatova lived to bear witness to all of her friends and literary acquaintances arrests and murders. Her own son and her second husband spent many years in prison. She was unpublished for 40 years in Russia, and she was forced to write odes to Stalin to save her son. So it was a grim time once the wars began and the revolutions began. But most of this book uh, is early poetry, and I hope to give you um, a taste of it. The poem um, that I'd like to do from Gumilev is called Giraffe. And perhaps, Harsha, you could come up and read it in Russian first. And then I'll take a, a turn in English. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, although Marilyn and I only met a couple of weeks ago, by sheer uh, serendipity, practically all the poems that she's translated are my favorites. And they've been a part of me for decades now, really, in, from about the age of 17 or 18. So this is a poem called Giraffe, and of course I'm going to be reading it in Russian. Giraffe. Сегодня я вижу особенно грустен твой взгляд, и руки особенно тонкие колени обняв. Послушай, далеко, далеко на озере чат изысканный бродит жираф. Ему грациозная стройность и нега дана, и шкуру его украшает волшебный узор с которым равняться смелится только луна, дробясь и качаясь на влаге широких озер. Вдали он подобен цветным парусам корабля, и бег его плавен, как радостный птичий полет. Я знаю, что много чудесного видит земля, когда на закате он прячется в мраморный грот. Я знаю веселые сказки таинственных стран про черную деву, про страсть молодого вождя, Но ты слишком долго вдыхала тяжелый туман, Ты верить не хочешь во что-нибудь, кроме дождя. И как я тебе расскажу про тропический сад, Про стройные пальмы, про запах немыслимых трав? Ты плачешь? Послушай, далеко на озере чат Изысканный бродит жираф. So you can think of this poem as um, a song to a sad mistress. Today, your glance is especially sad, your arms round your knees too thin by half. Listen, far off on the lake of Chad wanders a gentle giraffe. He's endowed with a slender grace, a magic design adorns his skin, and only the mobile moon's bright face over the lake is his twin. From afar, he looks like a ship's bright sails. He floats along like a joyous bird flies. I know that the earth will see many marvels as marbled with sunset he hides. I know cheerful tales of mysterious places, of a dark maiden and a young chief's passion. But you are enveloped in mists and traces and only believe in the rain. So how can I talk of a tropical world of graceful palms and the scent of grass. Listen, far off in the lake of Chad wanders a gentle giraffe. So that's a taste of Gumilev. He wasn't always that fanciful. Um, his poems can be a little um, surreal. And there's several of them in this book. So let's go on to Anna Akhmatova, the beauteous, much painted, much beloved, and long suffering. Akhmatova. And I think of this poem as, um, as a sort of celebration of the Stray Dog Cafe. It was written in 1917, right as the revolution was about to come down on them. Yes, I love them, those nightly gatherings, the icy glasses on little tables, 
the wintry smell of black coffee steaming, the wintry warmth of a fireplace glowing, a literary quip, caustic and charming, my lover's first glance, helpless, alarming. A lot of her work uh, was about lovers and heartbreak and the charm of the bourgeoisie. But after the, <laughs> after the revolution, her work darkens and um, deals with what's going on around her. And this is a really good example of the turn her works takes. Why is this age worse than what came before? Is it because in a stupor of grief and dread, we've handled the blackest wounds with our own hands, unable to heal them? In the West, the earthly light still glows. The roofs of the houses burn with its radiance. But here, white crosses mark the houses, calling the ravens, and the ravens are flying in. And Akhmatova had many chances to emigrate from Russia, but she chose to stay. And Lot's wife, I feel like, is her statement about that. And Harsha is going to read this one in Russian also. So needless to say, this is a, a poem based on the biblical story of Lot and his wife, uh, you know, uh, which you, uh, most of you, I think, would, would know. Uh, but think about it also as an allegory. Лотова жена. И праведник шел за посланником Бога, огромный и светлый, по черной горе. Но громко жене говорила тревога, не поздно, ты можешь еще посмотреть на красные башни родного Содома, на площадь, где пела, на двор, где прила, на окна пустые высокого дома, где милому мужу детей родила. Взглянула, Искованный смертною болью, глаза ее больше смотреть не могли, и сделалось тело прозрачною солью, и быстрые ноги к земле приросли. Кто женщину эту оплакивать будет, не меньше ли мнится она из утрат, лишь сердце мое никогда не забудет, отдавшую жизнь за единственный взгляд. So maybe you can get a sense of how Russian just naturally rhymes. I mean, all the verbs conjugate, all the nouns decline. And so that means that the endings are just naturally rhyming. And that's almost, I mean, it's not impossible to render in a modern American poem, but it's tough. So um, I mostly didn't exactly do that, but it, I did try to use assonance and half rhyme, slant rhyme to get some of that feel. So Lot's wife. God's luminous messenger, larger than life, led the one righteous man along the black mountain. But regret called out to his wife. It's not too late. You can still catch a glimpse of Sodom, the red roofs of home, the square where you sang, the yard where you spun, the tall house abandoned, the house where your sons and daughters were born. She looked back. A sudden arc of pain stripped her eyes of sight, fused her feet to the ground. Her flesh became transparent salt. Who will mourn this nameless woman? She seems the least of what we lack, yet I, for one, can never forget how she gave her life for one look back. Okay, so Mandelstam, I really feel that he is the genius of this group, poetically. He, his work has a kind of transcendental magic to it that captured my own spirit when I was a teenager and has still entranced me for the last 50 years. So um, actually, um, I'll start with these two poems that he wrote in 19, he was 19 and 20 when he wrote these very short poems. And I, when I first encountered him, I was 18, and I just felt so strongly what was in these poems. So, agonizing and vague, your image eludes me in the mist. Oh, Lord, I cried out by mistake, 
not having meant at all to say that. Like an enormous bird, God's name flew forth from my chest. Before me, a thick mist swirls. A vacant cage gapes from behind. And um, there's an essay that's actually translated in this book, not by me, because it's far beyond my capabilities, but by Boris Wolfson, that was uh, Mandelstam's manifesto on uh, his belief of what acme is and, and poetry should be. And he compares the poet to an architect who builds with stone. And each word has to be true and sound as the stone that an architect builds with. And I think of this poem, this next poem, which he wrote when he was 20, as sort of the standard bearer of that, the poetic version of that manifesto. I cannot bear the light of the monotonous stars. Welcome, my old delirium. You rise like a gothic tower. Let your stone become lace, a cobweb, let it stand. Wound the hollow chest of the sky with your skinny needle. My turn, too, will come. I feel in my bones the flexing wing. Yes, but where is it going after all, this living arrow of thought? Perhaps, worn out, I'll give up my flight through time and space. There, love was impossible. Here, love terrifies me. And, um, you know, Harsha just told me that he memorized as a as a young man, one of Mandelstam's poems that I wasn't going to read today, but, um, <laughs> but um, because of that, <laughs> it's on page uh, 28, Harsha, if you want to read it. So this is kind of amazing that we've both been carrying these poems with us since our teens, yes? Yeah, Without knowing each other. Without knowing each yeah, other. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So this is in part a love poem, um, but it's also about culture, about Greece, about many mysterious things. Uh, and, it, and the English first line is, gather joy from the palms of my hands. Vazmina radost iz moich ladoni, nemnoga sonsa i nemnoga mioda, kak nam velili pčoli Persefoni. Ne tvizac ne prikreplene lodki, Не услыхать в меха бутой тени, Не превозмочь в дремучей жизни страха. Нам остаются только поцелуи, Мохнатые, как маленькие пчелы, Что умирают, вылетев из уля. Они шуршат в прозрачных дебрях ночи, Их родина дремучей лес тайгета, Их пища время медуница мята. Возьми ж на радость дикий мой подарок, Невзрачное, сухое ожерелье, из мертвых пчел, мед, превративших в солнце. I think this is the poem that gave me the most trouble translating. Um, but I'll do the, I did the best I could with it, and that's what you're going to get. <laughs> Gather joy from the palms of my hands, a little sun, a little honey, just as Persephone's bees command. You can't untie a drifting skiff, or hear a shadow shod in furs, or banish fear from this desolate life. Now all that are left is ki are kisses, downy as the smallest bees that die just as they leave the hive. They rustle in night's transparent maze, their home, Tigetos's densest trees, their food, time, and mint and honeyed wine. So gather joy from my wild gift, a simple necklace of lifeless bees who once turned honey into sun. And this last poem of, of um, Mandelstam is, uh, is called a 16-line death sentence because it really did lead to his exile and death. He, uh, he never wrote it down. It was too incendiary to have on a piece of paper. But he memorized it and uh, rather foolhardily, I guess, as it turns out, recited it to a group of poets at Pasternak's gathering one evening. And one of those poets reported him. 
And uh, if Pasternak hadn't interested, some people say it was Pasternak's wife who reported him, who didn't like Mandelstam. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Lots of rumors. But in any case, Pasternak interceded and kept him from being executed. And he was exiled to a remote region of Russia called Voronezh. And then after a few years was pardoned and then imme almost immediately re-arrested and died on the way to the Gulag. And uh, one of the things I think is so extraordinary about this poem that Harsh is going to read in the Russian is it's got this mm, kind of rollicking, anapestic rhythm, which is at odds with the severity of the content. The content is harsh, but the rhythm is like, you know, it was the night before Christmas and all through the house. And um, anyway, let the poem speak for itself. So this is a poem that's actually in some ways not typical of Mandelstam because it's very direct, perhaps uh, foolishly so. And uh, <clears throat> this is the poem that people like to recite to remind us that in some parts of the world during the 20th century, you paid for poetry with your life. Мы живем под собою, не чуя страны. Наши речи за десять шагов не слышны, а где хватит на пол разговорца, там припомнит кремлевского дворца. Его толстые пальцы, как червы жирны, а слова, как пудовые гири верны, таракани смеются усища и сияют его голенища. А вокруг него сброд, только шеи их вождей, он играет услугами полулюдей, кто свистит, кто меня учит, кто хнычит, он один лишь бабачит и тычит. Как подкову кует за указом указ, кому в пах, кому в лоб, кому в гроб, кому в глаз, что не казан у него, где малина и широкая грудь осетина. Uh, so before I read, read this one, um, if you're interested in this period, uh, his Mandelstam's wife, Nadezhda Mandelstam, whose name in Russian means hope, wrote two wonderful books, Hope Against Hope and Hope Abandoned, that really tell the whole story of this period, and they're just quite readable and fascinating. So I call this the Stalin epigram. We live but cannot feel the earth. And if we speak, we can't be heard. But wherever they have a half conversation, they talk of that backwards lout in the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. Ten fat fingers like greasy worms. Each of his words weigh 50 pounds. <laughs> his mustache bristles with cockroach laughter and his polished jackboots glitter. His gang surrounds him, a spineless crew, half men who do what he tells them to. Some growl, some whimper, some yowl and hiss. He alone rages and bangs his fist. He forges decrees like horseshoes they fly at groin, forehead, eyebrow, eye, each execution sweet as a berry for this broad-chested thug from Gory. <laughs> so you can see why Stalin was a little upset. <laughs> And I just want to end with my very favorite poem from this book, the only one that I have been able to memorize in Russian, which is um, Akhmatova's poem written in 1940. So by this time, you know, her son's in jail, her second husband's in jail, Mandelstam's dead. Almost all of her friends have suffered. And one of the things Nadezhda Mandelstam says in her book is that, you know, after they would do the sweeps at night, they would come and arrest someone and go through their house. And then in the morning, people would be afraid to come around and offer support. But Anna was always there, the first one there. And uh, this is her, her poem. No ya prejdu prejdayu vas, Shto ya jivu v posledni ras, Ni lash tokoi, ni klonim, Ni trosnikom i ni vjezdoj, Ni rodnokovoju vodoj, Nikola Konim Zvonim. Nia budu ya lude smusjach. Isni chujia navisjach. Ne utelonim zvonim. Ah, but I am warning you. 
This life's the last I'm living through, not as a swallow or a poplar, not as a reed or a star, not as water from a well or a bell's hollow song. I won't return to trouble men or visit strangers' dreams again with my unquenchable lament. Thanks so much, and thanks to Brenda for being part of this. I feel like I got to be sort of the the uh, unknown singer-songwriter to open for Tina Turner, so. <laughs>